Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth. With your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi, I'm Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Today at the cafe, I'm excited to be speaking with Terry Potter, Chief Valuation Officer at Deal Valuation to discuss what you think about your business might be worth as a seller and the value to the buyer may not necessarily be the same thing. And what kind of steps can you take to make sure it happens that way? Terry, welcome. Thank you for having me, Angela. Um, to get things started, why don't you tell the audience about you and your company? Sure. Uh, my name is Kerry Potter. I'm uh, with Deal Valuation. I founded the firm uh, almost three years ago now. I've been valuing companies for 25 plus years. Uh, I won't tell you any more than that. <laughs> the extent that uh, it's an interesting little niche where you get to learn a lot about a lot of a uh, lot of different industries, a little bit of a lot about a lot. <laughs> and so, to the extent that uh, I started off with a small firm, mostly estate and gift oriented. Uh, rolled into KPMG for almost 10 years and then started my own firm. It's been an interesting route because the small firm, we had four or five people. We grew it to 40 people and four offices nationwide. KPMG is obviously a behemoth, uh, one of the big mm -hmm. four accounting firms. So we got to, uh, I got to work in that environment, big corporate. And then to roll back into a small firm and start it all over again is uh, an interesting cycle to go through. And obviously you're taking all your knowledge and experiences from those past businesses and trying to roll it into your own business. So here I am today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as, as you're talking, um, I, I think we talked a little bit uh, prior to this, uh, this session here, that I had an opportunity to, to sell my business. And I remember when I was talking to the, the people that were going to buy me and what I thought my business was worth, what, what they thought my business was worth, we, were, we had a lot of negotiate, negotiating to do. And uh, I would think on your case, some people leave that loving you to death. Some of them, maybe not so much. So we're going to explore some of that a little bit later on to really manage expectations because I think as a as an entrepreneur, we, we don't have expectations because we fall in love with what we're doing and expect it to be the value that we have in our mind, not necessarily what is in the marketplace. Before we start, uh, I ask a couple of questions. And the first one, because you have your own business, what keeps you up at night when you think about growing your own business? It's really the team. I mean, to the extent that, you know, I'm in a professional services firm, uh, it's really the professionals in the team that either make or break you. I think that's true probably for all kinds of different companies, uh, whether you're in professional services or manufacturing products. Uh, to the extent that I want to make sure they're happy, I want to make sure that they know they're valued, and I want to make sure that they have a goal in mind. Uh, um, even, even if it's not working at my firm, if it's working at another firm, um, I, I think the team is really, you know, the, the or essence of making a platform and making a place to work fun. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it is really about the people. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, in the service business, it is about the people to make that happen. We're not able to manufacture a widget that we get to sell over and over and over again. So That's it's right. It's really important about the team. Well, and also, to the extent that uh, valuation is kind of an interesting industry because people want to know the value of their companies as the economy increases and expands and as it declines and contracts. Mm -hmm. So the extent that we have business on both sides of the equation, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a good, uh, what do you call it, um, inflationary hedge. So. Okay. When you, you talk, we're talking about people, so let's stay on that for a second. Mm -hmm. When I sold my business, you know, we, we as, as the owners thought, we have all these clients and we have all these you know, millions of dollars in revenue, and the people that bought us said, we don't care because that business could go away tomorrow. What we're really interested in is you as an individual. So if you're, I won't pick on one that manufactures something, but let's say a service business that you're evaluating. How important are, are, the, are the people in, in the evaluation that you're doing? Oh, very important. People buy teams, right? And even if I have a client right now, they're selling their company, and to the extent that most of the people will go away, it's really looking at the team that got them to the point where they are. Is that, did that team do the right things necessary to build the infrastructure, the backing, everything else for a piece of technology that will be sucked, you know, sucked into a larger organization? If they didn't do everything correctly, that, that technology is not as valuable uh, you know, as it could be without the people or with the people. So it's still, did the team in the past do the right thing? Most people buy the teams going forward, especially with a lot of my clients for private equity or family offices. 
they're investing in a management team. Um, that's a big piece of it. Okay. Is there a typical time frame that you find that people that are buying in this situation with the people involved, it's a minimum of two years or it's five years or, I mean, obviously you want to lock in those people. You don't want them to make the deal and they quit the next day because you could purchase the company based on them. How do you, how do you kind of set that up so you have that team going forward? Uh, good question. Uh, to the extent that, you know, we, we, we see the documentation behind it, um, it's usually honestly a one or two year contract. Um, and to the extent that, you know, half the time they're gone in six months anyways, uh, it, it's a very floating aspect. Uh, to the extent that uh, the company that's buying them can integrate, they want to integrate quickly, get rid of the cost, right? So there's a lot of out clauses usually for the client, for the buyers. Yeah, because I think culture, of course, if you're being absorbed into another organization, could really disrupt. In, in my situation, for example, we sold my company, uh, the, the people that were buying us also bought my creative partners and put us together. So we actually got to create our own culture separate from what the parent company was because they were very different. So we were fortunate, yes. but yet I've seen it many, many times where people just don't like the culture that they're going into. Actually, I experienced that in one of my uh, probably last corporate jobs about five years ago. Small, 30-year-old company. I'll call it family-run in the sense the owner that founded it was still there. Behemoth came in. The, you know, on eleven billion dollar corporation came in and bought us, and we were a very different company after that. Yeah, no, culture is a big aspect, and to the extent that you ruin that culture, you you can destroy a business. I mean, honestly, and, and the extent that the smart guys, and I think there's a lot more firms that are that are getting more astute about this. They buy the organization, they leave the culture alone, they leave the people in place, they let it run the way it is. It's the reason they're as successful as they are, uh, to the extent that there's maybe more to it. Maybe I can cut some of the SG&A out. Maybe I can reduce my expenses by pulling this aspect of the company out. You know, finance teams obviously are usually the first to go. Uh, those mm -hmm. usually get, you know, taken out. But <clears throat> to the extent that the rest of them are super important to generating the revenue over and over and over again, um, you'll see as it gets more and more people intensive, the future is more and more dependent upon those people. You get more into um, structures, purchase structures that include earnout, that include some kind of contingent consideration, so that they make sure, hey, I'm going to pay you this, but I'll pay you more after a year from now if you hit certain goals. And so those are those become very important aspects as the people get more and more important. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, the other question that I have that I like to ask is, what is the best business advice you've ever received, and if it's the same that you give, or if it's different? What's the best business advice that you get? You know, um, as I get older, um, uh, I, one of the things that uh, Jack Welch said is, has resonated with me, uh, do things quicker, hire quicker, fire quicker, churn quicker. Um, I, I really, uh, I'm a driver at heart, and I, I emulate that in my driving. If I go up to a street and I know I need to turn right or left, I just go and make a right or make a left, wherever is more convenient. I don't know if I'm going to go the right direction, but usually really quickly I either figure I'm going the right direction or I figure I'm going the wrong direction. If you have a 50-50 shot, make the move. Not to make a move is to really not go anywhere. And, and he really talks a lot about that in his books. I think that's one of the best pieces of advice I've read. Um, to the extent that given, um, I really like talking about the valuation story. If you don't know your valuation story, then it's really hard to talk about your business to the two people that are most important, your customers and a potential buyer. And to that, to me, is kind of a high-level, you know, uh, more touchy-feely type, you know, advice. All right, let's, let's expound upon valuation story, right? Sure. I'm a storyteller. Sounds like you're a storyteller. At least you're advising people to be storytellers about the business. So expound upon that a little bit. Sure. So um, as, as on lots of my literature, there's cash flow, risk, and growth. This drives a business the extent that there's an old dividend discount model card called Gordon Growth Model, it's actually how you value a bond. It's just the cash flow over the risk, which is usually a risk-free rate or some kind of weighted average cost of capital, minus growth, which is a long-term growth figure. So, you know, never above 4 or 5%, usually 2 or 3% most like inflation. But you put those components together, and that creates a value. That, that, that formula literally creates a value. Well, as I started to talk to people about their company, about valuation in general, it became really easy to get them to understand these buckets. Is this a cash flow issue? Is it a risk issue? Is it a growth issue? Can we bucket in one of those things and how will that drive the company? And so to the extent that cash flow goes up, value goes up. 
as long as risk doesn't go up so much that it impairs that cash flow, right? So risk goes down, value goes up. Growth goes up, growth value goes up again. So in that kind of you know triangle of, of ideas um, comes your valuation story. What's your story about cash flow? How is it generated? What's important to it? Who are your customers? Growth. Who are you going to be in the future? Who are you trying to? Who are your next next set of customers? Uh, uh, Canvas is one of those uh, theories that people talk about about customer different groups that you need to be a part of. And then growth. And when I talk about growth, I talk about long term growth. Are you addressing a segment of people that is growing? Maybe it's uh, shrinking. Maybe it's a set of people that over the next five years is going to grow faster than anybody else. Those little changes to the model actually have a huge influence on value and a huge influence to those who might buy it. Okay. What's a typical time frame if I decided today I was going to sell my business? The Ponza Group, which is the one I sold originally, I got the name back. <laughs> but, but if I were going to sell my business today, I made a decision I wanted to do that. What are, what are the right steps to take? And, and what is my expectation on a time frame? I don't think it happens quick. In my case, it actually happened really fast. In hindsight, I wish we had dragged it out and spent a little more time, but you know, kind of time seemed to be essence. So what's, a, what's some good advice to listeners who are thinking about selling their business? If you ever think about selling your business, start the process now. Because to the extent that you understand, again, I'll go back to this valuation story. If you understand your valuation story, it's easier to uh, modify that, to uh, enhance it, to take out the things that increase risk um, as you're going along. And, and you need to start to know right from the beginning, who am I potentially going to sell to? What are they interested in? What are they buying? As you start to understand those aspects, you can then take small steps over a long period of time to address their need and keep track of what they're doing at the same time. So for me, I mean, unless you're building a lifestyle business, you should be thinking about from day one, what should I, what can I sell for this company for in, in five years and who am I going to sell it to? Because that should help you make decisions along the way. Who are my customer base? Do I really want to go after this market? Do I not want to go after this market? Do I want to go on the upper end of the market, lower end of the market? I think those things along with some general economics is really important to say, okay, I'm on the right track. And one of the practical pieces of advice that I, I give people is that if there are companies that are public that are similar to you, even if it's a far stretch, mm -hmm. listen to their quarterly conference calls. And at the very end of the conference calls, analysts get to ask questions of the company. Those questions are very usually are usually very pointed and very like they're trying to build models themselves on value, the analyst are. Mm -hmm. And so when they're asking the companies these questions, they're usually really important questions that are very insightful. All right. Well that's really good advice. I, it kind of leads me into my next question, which I think you answered a lot of it already, but are there some, in addition to what you just said, are there some best practices that, that a business owner should think about? Uh, from, a, from, uh, from my perspective, you know, it's really just making sure that you have the right team in place and you're, and you're taking the steps to build your valuation story. Um, and you know, people call it a lot of different things. Culture, they call it um, addressable market, they call it, you know, there's a lot of different inputs to it. But as soon as you start to um, put that mindset on mm -hmm. of value, now at least you're making decisions based on that, uh, on that criteria. I think a lot of people go into business and they with their heart and their gut and they make all these decisions based on those aspects or what's hot today, what's sexy, what's you know, and that's not always the best decision. If you look at it from a long-term value stream, who's going to buy me? Why are they going to buy me? How, you know, how is this going to be sold? Is it going to be based on revenue? Is it going to be based on earnings? Once you start to understand those aspects, you can really focus your attention on what's important. Do people come to you and, and say, hey, I'm thinking about selling my business in five years. You know, what are the steps? What are the metrics I need to pay, pay attention to? And in your case, what are those metrics that you as, as doing a evaluation really pay attention to? And is it kind of contingent on the industry? Is it contingent on the product and service? All those things wrapped up in one, go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, yes, all the above. All the above, oh yeah, yeah. we're done with that question. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, to the extent that it is very industry-based. Uh, it, it's also timing. I mean, to the extent that some people, um, like right now, we, I believe, are, are at probably the peak of an M&A market that we probably won't see again for a while. Money is so free-flowing. There's so much cash out there. 
there's so many great ideas and there's so many ways of distributing things that people are looking at this environment going, wow, if I can find a hot, sexy thing to buy, it'll enhance my public company's value, period, in a sense. Or it'll make me more diversified where I can sell at a higher price. Um, and to have the cash to pay for it. As, as the economy gets a little bit tighter, people are gonna have to really rethink those things. And to the extent that I usually like to bring a team in from the beginning and say, okay, let's talk about what's important. Is it international tax? Is it sales? Is it you know your your process? What are the drivers to your to to reduce risk, increase cash flow, and increase long term growth? If you start to have a team that starts to look at it and and start to at least identify that, now you're in a lot better place than than you could be. Okay, so uh, you just evaluated my company, and what we the conclusion is uh, it's not quite where I want it to be. What happens then? Are, are you working with an individual or an organization to tell them these are some of the steps, this is the areas based on cash flow and risk and all that. These are the things you need to mitigate, these are the areas you need to improve, and do you lay those strategies or do you just give them the guidance and they go off and work with their own teams? To... So I think maybe I heard that, uh, are you asking me if they don't like my answer? Because uh, it, it does happen. Yeah, yeah, um, actually. And to the extent that half the time, uh, when I get it right, half the people think I'm too high and half the people think I'm too low. Um, it, it's not a fine science. There is no right one answer. Um, I'm in a very inter interesting little niche where we work in this world called fair value or fair market value. It's the price a willing buyer and willing seller with all knowledge at the table uh, will pay. It's not the synergistic guy who just absolutely has to have you or has a super synergistic you know, integration process that he's gonna take and run with you, or put you through a distribution system that's you know, a thousand times bigger than yours. Those are very specific synergistic buyers. We help people understand that, hey, here's the data that's out there. Tell me where I'm wrong with the data. Because if, if the data is wrong, the wrong set of comparable companies, which is a huge problem, uh, the wrong set of financials or projections, those are things that we can change and we can address. I'll never know my, your business as well as you do. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm capturing all those aspects that you know that I don't. And then I bring data to the table and say, okay, here's the data. Where, where would be you different? Maybe we're similar margins to everybody else. Well, then we'll probably trade out on average, you know, similar margins, similar growth, similar profiles. Where we're going to trade on average multiple. If you think you're worth two times more than that, well, where's the data for it? And this is where people commonly get some multiple in their head that some investment banker or some, somebody else you know, gave them, and they're like, oh, I could, I could sell for 25 times revenue. Well, yeah, maybe not. Or, you know what, I own a dozen donut shops. No, shouldn't I trade at nine times revenue like Dunkin' Donuts used to? And I'm like, well, let's see. They make 30% plus margins, and by the way, they have 6% organic EBITDA growth. Uh, if you can match those kind of standards, and by the way, have a capitalization structure where you can borrow one third of your capital structure at 4%, then yeah, you should probably trade at that level. If you can't, well then, you're probably not trading at, a, at, at, at that kind of multiple. First of all, they don't trade at revenue, they trade at EBITDA, and they trade about 20 times EBITDA. Could you trade at 20 times EBITDA if Dunkin' Donut wants to buy you? Possibly. Okay, so in determining the multiple, I mean, is that typically based on industry standards or it's the data. It's the data. Yeah, it really is. I mean, to the extent that you drill in, and this is where it's really hard. Uh, Maker Studios, for instance, was one of my clients. They got bought by Disney. If you look at the announced deal, it was a $900 million deal. Everybody goes, wow, $900 million deal at the time was about 11 times revenue. To the extent that you start to break that down and you look at uh, Disney's 10K for the following year, you'll find out that $450 million of that was on contingent consideration. A group like me actually valued that contingent consideration at like 190 million. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the deal, not 900 million, it's more like 700 million. And then it's more like a six and a half multiple, not a nine. So you have to understand the data. You have to be able to pull it apart and show the reality of it and then say, okay, how do we compare with it? You represent both buyers and sellers. Right, so it doesn't really matter who, who approaches you. I mean, yes. you're typically representing, like a real estate agent, right? You're representing the buyer or the seller. I mean, is that always the case? Do you never represent both at the same time? 
No, I never represent both at the same time. I'm usually on the buyer side before they sell and on the seller side after they buy. A lot of my work is compliance oriented. Um, someone wants some tax valuation work. Someone wants a purchase price allocation after they purchase a company. Those are my typical projects. But at the same time, I'm seeing more opportunity and, and, and a lot more people interested before a deal is being bought. Family offices is a big one. They want to get in a space. They want to make this acquisition. They just don't have the internal team to be able to build the models. Mm -hmm. So we go in, we help them build the models, help them understand the data. At the end of the day, it's still their decision, but at least now they have a data you know, set to go with. Maybe they meet their corporate charter that, okay, we took these steps and we can move forward. So, but it's more often than not um, the buyer before the deal and the seller after. Okay. Tell me, uh, give me a story of, I'll say, one that's been really complicated, one that didn't quite go as well. And, and from there, what kind of lessons we could learn to not replicate those mistakes? Sure. Um, you know, from a valuation story standpoint? Sure. You know, to the extent that um, there's, uh, uh, in, in the cannabis space right now, it's a hot industry. And people thought for a while that everybody would trade at 10 times revenue, every store, every license, every, you know. The reality as you start to dig into the data is that profit will come and revenue will come. But when? And who will own it? And so as that story got mucked up, you, you had a longer tail to your projections and therefore a lower valuation. We were working with a company that had a buyer in that had a buyer in mind, wanted some documentation around the analysis, and at the end of the day, I brought them a set of documents that showed that hey, here's the transactions happening in the marketplace. Uh, yeah, they're kind of overpaying for you based on what you're telling me they're going to pay, and so that was not what they wanted to hear. To the extent that they didn't share that with the buyer, the deal fell through. You know, that was nothing on my part. It was really just a matter of uh, the, the industry and the market turning the way it was. Sure. So I've seen those situations where, you know, someone believes it's good timing, someone has the money to back them, and then all of a sudden the data starts to become more apparent and the data is really not supporting the story and someone on the other side pulls the trigger and says, yeah, no, we're not going to do this deal. I've been on the opposite end of the curve. I've given data that said, hey, this is worth X amount. And they came back and they sold it for 2x. And that's because somebody was just in their heart, didn't care about the dollars, they wanted to pay it, and someone was astute enough to hold out for it. And that's really where you know an investment banker and some other, you know, the private equity world does it really well. They find that person, um, very similar situation right now, where a company basically has two buyers out there. One is Intel and one is another smaller public company. If they don't sell to one of them, they're done. And to the extent that one, Intel just bought someone that's very similar to them, now it's down to one buyer. Okay. They're actually doing the deal with a one buyer at a multiple that no one would imagine. Again, very specific circumstances, but the private equity held out for it. And they were smart enough to know that their product, their people, had built such a great item that, you know what? They're going to pay for it. And okay. they did. So keeping the emotion out of it, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I have to. All right, well, we are coming to an end, uh, hard to believe. Once again, I say that every show. Mm -hmm. So we covered a lot of topics today talking about valuation. And, and really, my goal was for the listeners that are thinking about buying or selling a business to understand there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just going down to your local supermarket and, and buying a business. So to the audience then, what are your top two or three recommendations really to determine the right steps, the right process, that they should consider before they either purchase or sell a business? Make sure you know all the facts. And to the extent that you know, um, an investment banker is not your friend, you are his product, um, realize that they're trying to get a deal done and that there may not always be the best opportunity to, um, to gather that data later. Get it early, understand it, get it from independent sources, and then bring a team in that really can help you manage this risk, cash flow, and growth to maximize that value. Okay, fantastic. Well, Gary, thank you so much. Why don't you tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you and uh, you know how to contact you. Oh, great. Well, my name is Kerry Potter, like I said, and you can reach me at Kerry at dealvaluation.us. You can find me also on LinkedIn. 
Thank you, Angelo. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's been really exciting. Again, anybody out there thinking about selling their business or wanting to buy a business, I highly recommend that you give Terry a call. Well, thank you again for joining us at the cafe. You can find out more about me and read my blogs or view my show videos at theponzigroup.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. And if your business is in need of a CMO, but you're not ready to hire a full-time person yet, contact me. I'd welcome the opportunity to explore the benefits of using a fractional CMO. You can also subscribe to my show at thebusinessgrowthcafe.com, or we are on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and all major platforms around the world. Join me next week for lunch at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.